Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you're interested in these programs, you can join our membership and you can go to preservelincoln.org to join. Our videotaping today is sponsored by ProRail Nebraska and also the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our speaker today is Richard Schmeling. Um, a recent book published by South Platte Press called The Trains of Lincoln Station is co-authored by Richard Smelling and Michael Bartles and is the subject of today's presentation. Bartles has authored or co-authored 15 books about various aspects of railroad history and Schmelling has authored one previous railroad history book and a number of articles about railroading which have appeared in nationally circulated railroad magazines. Smelling's photographs have appeared in over 30 railroad books authored by others. Copies of the Trains of Lincoln Station is going to be available for purchase after the presentation and the authors will be glad to autograph the books. Richard's talk today is titled The Trains of Lincoln Station 1960 to 2012. Please join me in welcoming Richard Smelling. Thank you. I'm absolutely overwhelmed at the number of people that showed up for this. And uh, hopefully uh, when you leave at the end of the session, you'll know a lot more about uh, the trains of Lincoln Station and, uh, uh, and what's been going on in Lincoln. The title of the book uh, says 1960 to 2012, but uh, we have some photos that are prior to 1960 to kind of look at the early history of the station. The focus, however, is not on the station itself. The focus is on the trains of Lincoln Station. And uh, the, most of the photos in the book are color photos. Uh, they are from a number of different photographers and they document the trains that went in and out of the station. So I'm going to go ahead and you have uh, on the screen uh, the presentation. The, this is from the title of the book. This is what the title page of the book looks like. And uh, that picture shows a freight train going through the station and you'll recognize the station in the background. To kind of orient you as to the significance of Lincoln as part of the Burlington system, we have a map. And this map goes back to the early days of railroading. And it shows Lincoln as a hub in the system. And uh, Lincoln has always been a major point on the old Burlington system and continues to be today as a part of Burlington Northern Santa Fe. We have lines that run out of Lincoln uh, eastward and eventually end up in Chicago. We have a line that goes uh, out west and ends up in Denver. We have a line that goes north and goes up to Sioux City and on into uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, the Twin Cities, and we have a line that goes southeast out of Lincoln that ends up in Kansas City. So this was kind of a, a gathering point for Burlington activity. Let's go ahead and take a look at a bit of a timeline. The Burlington and Missouri River Railroad in Nebraska was completed into Lincoln in 1870. And uh, it doesn't say Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, but a lot of the construction was done under different names. We had the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad in Nebraska. There was Burlington and Missouri River Railroad in Iowa. And then there were some other lines that were constructed that eventually became part of the Burlington system. Now we're kind of focusing in on Lincoln just a little bit, and uh, in 1880, uh, a new brick two-story depot was built to serve as the Burlington uh, Station in Lincoln. At that point in time, 
trains from the Atchison and Northern Railroad and the Midland Pacific Railroad also started using the new uh, station. Um, Atchison and Northern was a line that came up from, as the name suggests, Atchison, Kansas and came to Lincoln and the Midland Pacific was the railroad that built from Nebraska City uh, westward and came through Lincoln and then extended on up through Seward and and kind of kept on going. The original depot in Lincoln was a wooden structure and uh, it it was not a very big depot. Of course, Lincoln at that point in time wasn't very large, so we didn't need a big depot. Then what we did was we suddenly became important and we have the original depot uh, and it was uh, fairly substantial. It was uh, made out of brick. We're looking generally in a northeasterly direction and we can see uh, some of the buildings that are still there in the Haymarket in the background. And notice we have quite a bit of activity. Uh, we have a number of railroad passenger cars parked there. That depot uh, served well, but at some point in time, we started having so many passenger trains and so many passengers through the Lincoln Station that we needed to do something different. So. In 1927, the depot that you just saw was replaced by the modern brick depot, and uh, that depot is the depot that stands there today in the Haymarket area. To kind of orient you, this is a street side view of the 1927 depot. Um, the downstairs area of the depot has, where the waiting room was, has been substantially revamped and there's a great hall and they, they have a number of events there. Um, the second and third floors of this 1927 depot uh, were Burlington offices and they continue today to house offices from Burlington Northern Santa Fe. On the north end of the depot, we had an annex, and that was essentially used for railway express uh, shipments and for mail. And we have uh, the street side view of the depot, where you have the center parking in front of the depot. That was originally the path for the Lincoln streetcars. We had several streetcar lines that came and served the depot. and. Uh, those are gone now, uh, but uh, they were very important in the scheme of transportation in Lincoln at one time. The, through the years there have been some very interesting displays at the depot. In 1959, Lincoln celebrated its centennial and the railroad being a good corporate citizen and very closely connected with Lincoln brought in a large display. Then in 1970 we had a celebration of the Burlington Missouri River Railroad arrival in Lincoln and uh, we celebrated that with a special excursion train. This is a, more or less a, a, an updated map and in uh, the 30s and 40s a lot of the branch lines in Nebraska were truncated, were cut off. So uh, Lincoln is still uh, the hub of a number of lines but some of the branch lines in outstate Nebraska have disappeared by this time. Then, uh, in 1970 also, uh, the Burlington Northern wa was formed by a merger of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, uh, Great Northern, Northern Pacific, and Spokane and Seattle Railroads. So then we went into a new era, and that was uh, to last uh, for quite a while. 
1971, the nation's rail passenger system was struggling. Uh, most of the trains were operating at a loss and the freight railroads wanted to get out of the passenger train business. So what happened was Congress formed an entity known as Amtrak. And Amtrak on May 1st of 1971 took over all the passenger trains in the United States. It didn't keep all the trains. A number of them were, uh, were discontinued, but at least we ended up with a network of rail passenger service. Now on June 25th, 2012, uh, we were well into the construction of the arena and revising that area down around the station. Uh, so what happened was the tracks that went through the passenger station were removed. There, there are still remnants down there, but for all intents and purposes, the Lincoln Station no longer had passenger trains going through it. Uh, on June 25th, the number six, the eastbound California Zephyr, uh, stopped at the station, and then overnight, essentially, or in the afternoon, everything got shifted to the new Amtrak station, and number five, the westbound California Zephyr that came through shortly after midnight became the first train to use the new Amtrak station on the west side of the Haymarket area. In my lifetime, I have seen a complete change in rail passenger service. When I was a kid growing up, you could basically, in any town in Nebraska, you could get on a passenger train and you could go places. And uh, unfortunately, uh, several factors uh, came into play. Number one, uh, of course, we started having paved roads. And the early roads were, if, if they were lucky, were gravel, they were impassable during poor weather, and the railroads were the only way to go. But we started getting paved roads. The other thing that happened uh, was that at some point in time, a decision was made to remove the U.S. mail from the passenger trains. And this was a death blow for many passenger trains because the railroads were operating those passenger trains close to the, the break-even point, and when the mail revenue went away, then suddenly they couldn't afford to continue to use the trains. And of course, we can't discount the fact that airlines, which in the 20s and teens were kind of, you know, rickety affairs and, and not too reliable, the airlines then developed. And we went uh, from the point of, of rickety airplanes to more substantial propeller-driven airplanes and finally the modern jet planes. So, what we have here kind of gives you an idea of what's happening to the trains of Lincoln Station. In 1940, the Burlington still had 41 trains, and the Union Pacific, which was a tenant in the station, had 10, total of 51. By 1941, notice that we have quite a, quite a drop in the number of trains. Part of this was due to the fact that in, at the start of World War II, the federal government uh, created a railroad administration, and what they were doing was they knew we were going to enter World War II, and what they tried to do was they tried to trim things uh, and eliminate some duplicate service so that when the war actually kicked in, we'd have plenty of engines and passenger cars and freight cars and so on to move the wartime traffic. So that pretty much explains the drop in 1941, from 40 to 41. By 54, uh, the last of the Union Pacific motor car passenger trains had quit running through Lincoln, but we still had 26 trains on the Burlington, which is pretty good. And then by 1960, we dropped to 20 trains, 
And then when Amtrak takes over in 1971, we're down to only two trains that are using the station. What was interesting to me was that uh, in the early years uh, of the changes from Burlington to Burlington Northern to Burlington Northern Santa Fe, not much changed in the station area. It pretty much remained the same as it had been. But once the arena construction started, then there were radical changes. Um, this view shows Lincoln Station and all the associated trackage. Uh, Memorial Stadium is, is kind of a landmark there. And uh, to the west of the passenger train tracks, there was a downtown freight yard that was used to service freight customers in the Haymarket area. Um, this view is from uh, approximately 1940. And again, we're looking northeast. We're showing the Burlington Passenger Station. Notice the neat little shed down there in the foreground. Uh, we have some passenger cars there uh, in the station. And we have what we call umbrella sheds. And those umbrella sheds were uh, used to provide shelter in bad weather for the passengers. The uh, Lincoln Station had a system where you went down into a subway as you came out of the station, and then you went along the subway, and then you'd come up on the station platforms so that you could utilize tracks two, three, four, and five and not get out in the rain or the cold weather. This next view uh, again shows the 1927-era station. And what we have is we have some business cars parked in the spur. Those spur tracks south of the station and there were some north of the station were used for some short trains and then they were used to park business cars or mail cars or dining cars or whatever. Notice that at this point in time, the umbrella platforms are still in place. Now we're going to go back in time again to about 1940 and apparently we're in a tall building and we're looking to the northwest and uh, we see the umbrella sheds, we see some passenger equipment and we see a series of buildings. Those buildings were used to house the supplies and the tools and so on and the men that serviced the passenger trains. A number of passenger trains would terminate in Lincoln, remain overnight, get resupplied, restocked, refixed, and then go out the next day. Uh, the Lincoln station was originally heated by a boiler plant. And notice the tall stack there and the brick boiler house. And then beyond that, you see some freight cars, and that would have been what we call the downtown freight yard or the X yard. And we're looking, as I say, generally in a northwest direction. You can see uh, in the foreground some uh, glass structures under the station platforms. That's where you came up from the subway and then went along the platform to get to your train. This next view shows a very busy station, and we're looking more northerly. Uh, again, 1940, and uh, we see a lot of activity, a lot of uh, passenger cars in the station. We see the umbrella sheds, and uh, um, we see the support buildings. Uh, and Quite often when the train came in, the switch engine would take the cars from that train and take them over to those support buildings and leave them and then the next morning would bring them back to the station for loading. Obviously, uh, this, this whole business required some con command and control. We had two towers that were involved with the Lincoln Station and these are pictures of the two towers uh, the larger building with the auxiliary building is called Hall Tower. 
That was located at approximately 4th and J Streets in Lincoln. That controlled the entrance and exit to the south part of the passenger depot. It also controlled the crossing of the Union Pacific Line that crossed to Burlington at that area. The north end of the station and the approach tracks uh, were controlled by the other tower that you see there, and that was called Baird Tower. Both of those towers remained for many years until finally uh, they were replaced by a central control uh, situation at the freight yard uh, called Carling Tower, and those buildings are both gone. We talked about the 1959 uh, centennial of Lincoln, and as I said, Burlington did, did themselves proud. This is an old steam engine that has been dollied up, and then we have a replica of a uh, wooden mail car, and those were brought in for display. The mail car uh, as I say, as a replica, they didn't have any examples of those left, so they essentially built one from old plans. One of the fixtures of Lincoln Station in terms of trains of Lincoln Station was a train called the Pioneer Zephyr. And as you can see from my t-shirt, I, I have the Pioneer <coughs> Zephyr t-shirt. The Pioneer Zephyr was the first diesel streamlined passenger train. Now I stress the word diesel because Union Pacific had a streamlined train but it was a gas distillate powered passenger train. So what we get into is we get into a, a diesel powered uh, train. The Pioneer Zephyr was what we call articulated, that is that the engine and cars shared a set of trucks. Uh, this was uh, okay, but it created some problems down the road because if you had a car in the middle of the train that went bad, it was hard to remove it and, and replace it. Uh, the Pioneer Zephyr uh, went on a, a record-breaking run from Denver to Chicago and it was able to make the entire trip within, as I recall, 24 hours. And uh, at some point in time, the <coughs> Pioneer Zephyr was then brought to Lincoln. It was used regularly out of Lincoln Station on a passenger train that went down to St. Joe, Missouri. And so we had that guy around here quite a bit. And it was a nice bit of history to be able to see it. Uh, that type of engine is called a shovel nose engine. Um, and that train eventually, in about 1960, went out of Lincoln and went to Chicago to the Museum of Science and Industry and was on display there. It was outdoors and there were some problems with weathering and so on. And the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry sent it to um, a railroad restoring place and it was completely refurbished and it's now inside and protected from the weather at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. We talked about having a special train to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the arrival of the uh, Burlington Missouri River Railroad in Nebraska and uh, this is the special train that was operated. Notice the red, white, and blue bunning on the front of the train. Uh, there were several Vista Dome cars in the train and that train essentially went from Lincoln up to Omaha and around the loop uh, and, and came back to Lincoln. As I recall that train, uh, that was a fundraiser for the Lincoln Symphony and uh, I was a young college guy about that time and I was one of the car attendants that uh, helped people on and off that train. It was quite a trip. <clears throat> we, uh, we had an interesting uh, picture that was taken at the depot. The train that you see in the background is another articulated train except it's bigger than the Pioneer's effort. It's called the Nebraska's effort. 
And that train left Lincoln every morning about 9.15 or 9.20 to go to Chicago. And it was a daytime train. There were two sets of equipment. They were named after the gods and goddesses. There was the male set and the female set. And those two sets of equipment provided that daytime service. We also had some overnight trains called the Exarban Zephyr. And the front of the engine that you see uh, had come in on the Exarban Zephyr. It, was, it left Chicago in the evening and got into Lincoln about um, seven or eight or nine o'clock in the morning. So what we have here is we have Nebraska Zephyr ready to go east and the Exarban Zephyr power that's just come into the station. In addition to the regular trains in the Lincoln station, we had, for a period of time, a bunch of football specials. The Burlington was one of the railroads that even fairly late in the passengers uh, era when, when they were losing money, they still hung in there. So what they were doing is they were running passenger, football passenger specials from Omaha to Lincoln. And we're at the north end of the station and we're seeing a couple of those football specials. It's late afternoon and pretty soon the fans will be coming down from Memorial Stadium and those trains will be going back to Omaha. They ran as many as four of those trains. Uh, it, was, it was quite a fantastic operation and uh, at uh, some point in time the after Amtrak took over, there was a gentleman from Omaha by the name of Bill Cratville who had some railroad cars that he owned and he continued to run at least one passenger special. We, in addition to the passenger trains, we also had occasionally some freight trains that would go through the passenger station and of course this became more prevalent as you had fewer passenger trains because that would free up tracks. This is a Burlington Northern hot <coughs> westbound train. We're south of the station and what's happening is we're changing the crew. That particular train didn't need to be switched or fueled or anything in Lincoln so as a result all we did was we ran it through the passenger station, changed the crew, and then sent it out on what we call the passenger bypass line on, the, on its way to Denver. Through the years we had uh, quite a number of interesting engines that would come to the station. This is um, a Southern Pacific engine and the Southern Pacific engine normally would be two-tone orange but it's been specially painted because it's going to end up pulling the American Freedom Train and it's deadheading on its way through Lincoln uh, to go to Omaha to pick up the Freedom Train. And uh, it, it had just a tool car and I think a caboose when it came through Lincoln. Um, I was fortunate and got a chance to go down there and see it. This was June 30th of 1975 when that particular engine came through. And if you look at the front of the engine, you'll see some sort of little ripples or dents in the skirting. That happened out at Dorchester. There was some truck or tractor that got caught on the track and it hit the engine and that put some crimps in the, in the sheet metal. And fortunately, when they got the engine up to Omaha, they were able to straighten out that that problem and, and restore the, the metal work. 710, probably most of you are familiar with 710. It's still down there and uh, in the hay market. Uh, and it was originally manufactured at our Havelock shops in Lincoln. And then was rebuilt from a passenger engine to a freight engine and uh, is, has been on display down there at the Iron Horse Park for a number of years. Um, we had, uh, many of you will recall, that we had some freight cars behind that steam engine at one time. The idea was they were going to make them into shops as small specialized merchandise things, but nobody 
figured out apparently how hot those boxcars got in the summertime. <laughs> so that didn't happen. Those boxcars are gone and uh, uh, they've been scrapped. In the background, what you're seeing is you're seeing a special engine uh, that Burlington Northern painted and that was to uh, commemorate the veterans of the Gulf War. And that engine, this picture is June of 1992. That engine was down there because of Haymarket heydays. It was one of the display items that the railroad brought in. And a, a fun train that used to come through the Lincoln Station was the Santa train. Uh, this Santa train was put together by the Burlington Northern employees out in Alliance. Uh, it consisted of an engine, a boxcar, and a flat car with a bunch of Christmas type decorations and the caboose. And Santa rode in the caboose. Santa and Mrs. Claus, and they had candy. And when the kids came to see the Santa train, they could go aboard the caboose and see Santa and, and get candy. Unfortunately, that's not happening anymore because uh, it got to be so popular that uh, it was, its route was expanding and the Burlington Northern basically said, we can't afford to pay all these people to go all these days to be away from Alliance. So we don't have a Santa train coming to Lincoln Station anymore. Um, Tom Jurgens is uh, present in the audience and uh, Tom took a lot of pictures that are in this book, and this is a Tom Jurgens photo of the Santa train, very, very nicely done. We, uh, I'm, I'm going back to this one simply to kind of set the stage because there was a change when the Great Hall was uh, done by Arter Associates. Uh, then we no longer wanted to have the Amtrak station in the old Lincoln station. So what we did was we moved it to that baggage annex. And there it is, it's much smaller. Of course, we only have a couple of trains a day, so we don't need a big station. But um, it, uh, it served for a number of years until the point in time when we did the arena and we moved everything further west. And of course we have the Iron Horse Park with the replica water tower uh, draining water into the nice little pond there. Um, this particular shot shows Lincoln pretty much has always been a crew change point. So what we have is we have the eastbound California Zephyr stopped at the station. We have the outbound crew getting off, the inbound crew getting on and uh, that train at some point in time will then take off and head toward Chicago. Notice we still have the boiler plant. It's still intact and uh, that boiler plant stuck around for quite a while and then finally uh, more modern heating and air conditioning was done uh, for the depot and then the need for that steam boiler plant uh, disappeared. This particular photo that you're seeing was number six uh, in 1995, and the type of Amtrak engine, if, for those of you that like trivia, was an F40PH. This is another Tom Jurgens photo, and this shows the last eastbound California's effort to use the old Lincoln Station. Uh, this is a different type of engine, and it's been repainted in a heritage paint scheme. And this particular shot was on June 25th of 2012. Remember I said that on that date, the eastbound train came to the old station, the westbound train came to the new station. Back to 1998 and, and just kind of an aerial review of, of what things looked like before the arena went into place and all the tracks through the passenger station, the freight yard on the west hand side, and of course our iconic Memorial Stadium. Compare that view with what happened after 
the Pinnacle Bank arena was put in place. We no longer have tracks running through Lincoln Station. We have the new Amtrak station and all the railroad tracks have been moved further west. So that represents a tremendous change in that area. This particular view, uh, notice the dome of the arena in the background. We have a, an empty coal train on the freight bypass tracks going past the current Amtrak station. At the Amtrak station, we have a special train, and that particular train is uh, a museum-type train and had exhibits in the passenger cars, and that came to Lincoln. It's interesting that one of the crew members, when asked about, well, are people coming to see this train, he said, we've had more people in Lincoln than we had when we were in St. Louis. <laughs> which indicates, a, which indicates a, 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 a pretty ongoing connection between people in Lincoln and the railroad. So I've gone on quite long enough now. Uh, some of you may have some questions. If so, feel free to ask those questions. I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, those that I can't do, Mike, I'm sure, will be able to answer. So anybody got any questions? Pardon? Where were the UP tracks? The UP tracks, okay. Let's go back a little bit. And if I could get back far enough to what I'm looking for. That 98 map would have showed. Yeah, yeah, it sure would have. Okay. Your UP tracks, notice the, the smokestack for the boiler. Okay, then you've got your X yard and then beyond that would be the Union Pacific. And uh, their line always went west of the Burlington. And of course, as I mentioned, they went ahead and uh, uh, utilized, for passenger trains, they utilized Lincoln Station. In the background, Dick, you can see that a Union Pacific bridge and a Burlington bridge over Salt yeah. Creek. Yes. Valley Boulevard overpass. Tom, Tom Jurgens has just reminded me that in the background we can see the Union Pacific Bridge and the Burlington Bridge over Salt Creek in the background. So that gives you a rough idea of, of where those went. And I might mention that not only did Burlington run some football specials, we show it in the book, but we don't show it here because we were kind of limited for space and time. But the Union Pacific from time to time would run passenger specials out of the Lincoln Station. I remember writing when I was in the university in the university band, I went down to Norman, Oklahoma on a UP passenger special out of Lincoln. Um, and uh, they ran some passenger specials uh, out of here to go to the Minnesota game. And uh, also, I think Nebraska played University of Wyoming and they had a passenger special on the UP that went to Laramie. So uh, again, quite a bit of activity. This, this lady. What were you talking You described somehow a train, a, some train, and you called it a male and a female or something? Oh, okay, sure. All right. The question <laughs> is, I described a train, and I was talking about a male and a female train. Those were the Nebraska Zephyr trains, and one train had the name of male gods, and, and so... And so those were male names. And then the other train had female goddesses. And one of the cars that I recall was the Venus. And Juno was one of the cars. But um, they, they essentially tried to keep with that theme. Um, the Zephyrs were named after Zephyrus. And we have a picture of Zephyrus on my t-shirt. And Zephyrus was the god of the west wind. So we were kind of into that mythology thing. <laughs> okay, who else has a Yes, yes, over here, sir. Do you have uh, that, that photo right there? That's not the barracks for the Germans from Russia, is it? No, no, it certainly isn't. The question was, is in, are the buildings in the photo the barracks for the Germans from Russia? And the answer is no. Those, those are 
buildings are all connected with the Burlington Railroad. What do you know about the Germans from Russia as employees? Well, of course, I can I can give you through a long detailed history. Of course, uh, uh, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great uh, attracted German citizens to go to Russia because she wanted to modern. They wanted to modernize the country. Then Ivan the Terrible became the Tsar, and he essentially negated all the promises that had been given to the Germans that came to Russia. At that point, they emigrated. Many of them came to Scotts Bluff and that area and worked the sugar beets, and many of them ended up in Lincoln. And they were uh, across from the Memorial Stadium in what we call the Russian Bottoms. And yes, many of the German Russians did become railroad employees, and um, many of them worked for the railroad for many years. I, I, that's about as specific as I can get. Okay, who else has a question? Yes, sir. When you talked about the pioneer Zephyr coming from St. Joe to Lincoln, and you said it, it went to a museum about 1960, I rode that train from Fall City to Lincoln, and I graduated in 1960, so I must have been one of the last people to ride that train. <laughs> it came to, I've ridden the train from Fall City to Lincoln several times, but only once did I see that particular train. So they ran yes, the yes. And my a question I have, I've been told there's more, there was more than one of those. Is there uh, one of those Zephyrs like that? Yes, yes. There were other Zephyrs. There was a Zephyr called the Mark Twain Zephyr. There was one called the Silver Streak. And the question was, uh, this gentleman rode that train from Paul City to Lincoln, but uh, he remembers riding it when it didn't have the Pioneer Zephyr equipment on it. And that was because the Pioneer Zephyr could only handle one leg of that train, the one going south, and there was another train probably made up of more conventional railroad equipment that was the north counterpart that came north. So I you, sat in the back car, which was uh, tapered toward the back, and uh, I remember that, and the, and the chairs were along the side of the car. Yes, the, the gentleman recalls that uh, the last car of the train uh, had an observation area that was tapered and there were cars there and you certainly got to see a nice view when you uh, were back in that area. Yes, sir. All right, uh, the comment was that uh, one of those early uh, shovel-nose uh, streamlined passenger trains has been preserved down at BNSF headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas. So if you're down in the Fort Worth area and you want to go and see it, why, it's on the campus down there. Thank you. Anybody else, any comments? Questions, yes, Elaine. You Umbrella sheds. Umbrella sheds. And all during the rebuilding of this area, when they were doing the arena, they called them canopies. And they and now that we have a canopy street, we should have had an umbrella street. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question, the question that Elaine brought up is that uh, I referred to those those coverings along the tracks as umbrella sheds. And now, uh, when we talk about the rail yard and so on, they're referred to as canopies. Uh, I suspect the umbrella shed is more a railroad term and the canopy is more a generic term, but they're the same thing. And then they also restored one of those, didn't they, where they come up? Didn't they you, restore one of those? And is it in its original place or is it in a new place? The question was, uh, they saved one of those umbrella sheds, didn't they, and restored it, and it's still, it's still down in the rail yard. The answer is yes, that was one of the original umbrella sheds. Uh, the wood was rotting pretty badly, and uh, Arter and the people down there spent some bucks, and yes, there's still a section of that shed down there, so you can go down there and see what it looked like. Yes, sir. When I was a boy, I would ride the train up for the football game from Omaha to Lincoln. And I remember the, the mail car had been converted to the bar car. 
<laughs> and there was the, you know, the, the wide, big openings for the old mail cars. That was just open, and there were just a tuba floor across it. So, did, was there any record, or was anybody falling out of the <laughs> This gentleman recalls writing a football special, and uh, they had a baggage car, and the doors, uh, the metal doors were open, and there were a couple of two befores. One, one, one. And did anybody ever fall out? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. When we ran the steam excursions out of Lincoln, and that's the, there's some steam excursion photos in the book, they had a gondola car with wooden benches, and that was on the end of the train. And I was always worried that somebody, some rail fan, was going to go overboard, so to speak, and end up tumbling out of there. But to the best of my knowledge, that never happened. It's amazing. Today, we wouldn't do those sort of things because of liability. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Any questions? Well, that gives us about enough time to go ahead and uh, do some book signing for those of you that are interested. I would also uh, indicate to you that Mr. Reisdorf has another book that he has done, and this is it. It's available in the gift shop. It's called The Burlington Route in Focus, and it has some photographs here in Lincoln, a number of them, and uh, there are some nice inside the depot photos in this particular book. And uh, so, if, if you're interested, go ahead and get both books. And uh, uh, this one, again, uh, was uh, Mr. Reisdorf was one of the authors, and Michael was the co-author, and they'll be glad to autograph those books for you. So with that, I guess uh, we'll adjourn, and thank you all for coming. I